and a very warm welcome to the Crash MotoGP podcast, episode 30, with myself, Harry Benjamin, Pete McLaren, and Keith Hewin. On the show today, I will be taking a look back and unpacking all the major news from the Jerez test. But before all of that, we are delighted to be joined this week by MotoGP technical director, Danny Aldridge. Danny, thank you so much for making the time for us, first of all. I know Keith and Pete have arm themselves uh, with a myriad of questions for you but I'll try and ease you in with a with a first one and everyone knows listen to this podcast I'm actually a bit of a MotoGP newbie this has been my my rookie season so first question for you is can we just start by asking what the actual structure is for making technical regulations how do you come about with them to begin with how does it work very simply obviously we have what's called the GPC Grand Prix Commission so Comprising Grand Prix Commission is obviously uh, ERTA, Dorna, FIM, and the MSMA, the manufacturers. Uh, any of those bodies, including myself, can propose a rule. It can only be proposed. Uh, that will be submitted to the GPC. Uh, and if it's approved, and then obviously it goes into a rule book. So my main job as a technical director is obviously, firstly, to control the rules. Uh, but during the year, many times I will make rules myself or propose a rule, a proposal. Uh, that will then go through that process. As I said, obviously, it would have to go, normally goes to the ERTA committee first. If they agree to my proposal, it's then forwarded to the GPC. Uh, and that body or organisation will say yes or no, basically. And if it's agreed, it's put in a rule book either instantly or it could be postponed to the following year, depending on what the rule is. It could be, okay, we need to do it from the next race, or it's a rule for next year, 2022. But mainly structure is the GPC will agree to any proposals, and if they are, will go through onto the rule book. It's a great system in as much as that the rule book is actually quite thin for MotoGP, isn't it? It's not, it's not a great big fat book of, of really tight technical regs. Yeah. Uh, it's getting bigger, unfortunately. That's the worst thing. Uh, if, if, if you remember, Keith, in the old days of the, the two strokes, it was literally just weight and fuel. There was nothing, no electronics, nothing like that. And it's going so much towards electronics, that side of stuff, the aero, which we already probably get onto. But yeah, it's it's thin, but I would like it thinner, to be honest. It makes my life a lot easier. Uh, the less rules, the, the better it's easy to control, because that's a problem. But uh if you go compare it to, say, like the FIA with Formula One, it's totally different. I'm sure they've got cyclopedias over there. But for us, it's not too bad. We're, we're, we're trying to manage it. Do the team self-regulate? Do the got, teams, is, is there like a whistleblower yeah. protocol? Is there something along those lines? Yes, always. I, I have the, My organisation basically consists of myself and Jordi Perez, who works for me with the MotoGP, and then we have 20 local guides. But then I have a thousand people in a paddock who are looking at every other bike. So yeah, and and you, the journalists, are just as bad. I'll get a phone call or something like that. Is that <laughs> you, correct? No, no. From that side, so I mean, just I've got as eyes good. everywhere. Just you as mean good. Just Sorry, as good. Yeah. I have to say, yeah, 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 yeah. But I would say every week someone will come to me and say, "Oh, have you seen that? Is that legal? Is that right?" So yeah, there's there's eyes everywhere in the paddock. You can't get away from it, can you? Well, you say that no. you know, that sounds like an incredibly small team for for something yes. for such a huge task for a, for a world championship. How do you sort of battle, you know, against some of the the best brains? You're up against so many manufacturers, increasing, you know, more teams as well under the umbrellas of manufacturers. Uh, who who wins out at the end of the day? Uh, hopefully, we do. Uh, there's always <laughs> situations that crop up and. Their their job, obviously, the manufacturer, is to look at the rule book and try to find not loopholes, uh, ways around the rules, and make sure it's legal and stuff like that. So they they not don't employ people. There's always people saying, ah, but our interpretation of the rule is this, and this is my biggest problem: interpretation of the rules. Uh, the more black and white, yes or no, it makes my job a lot easier. But when it's interpretation, mm-hmm. oh, we believe is this, someone else will believe something different. So. That's where the battles tend to happen in that area. But it's it's we are always trying to catch up the manufacturers a little bit, especially Moto GP, not so much Moto Two, Moto Three, but Moto GP. They're always saying, okay, yeah, this rule, we believe it's this. Uh, and the clever ones do find ways around what we're written, and then we have to try and close that door later on. 
what's got through in past years that you you and the FIM and particularly Erta, what 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 what's got through that you really wish you'd been across before it actually got to the track? Uh honestly, aero. I think that's the biggest, biggest thing. It's aero, the aero packages. And I think I know this is a big debate with your listeners and everyone like this is over the years. A lot of people, I'd say most people hate it really, but you do see it sort of filtered down slightly now in the production bikes, which is a different story. But what we've managed to do, because there was no rules for aero many years ago, about four or five years ago, and Ducati every week brought out a different fairing every single week, new wings just added here and here. And this was like, Oh, hang on, this ain't good. Uh, but the, once someone's done something, it's extremely hard for us to stop it because basically it's a rule change. Uh, and, and we don't like to do that. Or Dawn and Erta don't like to do that. If someone's found an area that is not dangerous, so we say, okay, we have to then adapt to it. But what we've done, which I think is sort of semi-closed the door, is made it so that, okay, you only get one upgrade during the year. So that's reduced the costs a lot where Ducati were bringing new shapes every single week. So it's a compromise, the sort of thing. But honestly, I would say Aero would have been a lot better if we could have maybe closed the door a lot earlier. But uh, but now I think it's sort of settling down a bit, a lot more. Well, is it? Because obviously next year, you know, you've got the likes of Ducati with eight bikes out on the grid and you've got you know, Suzuki with just a couple of riders out on the grid. That's obviously a bit of an imbalance regarding sort of data and, and technical. Well, just give us a clue, because even though I'm, I'm pretty close to this, I still don't get it half the time. You know I'm a bit thick, Danny. We've known yeah. each other for a long time. <laughs> I mean, you've got, you've got eight eight We're bikes. We're the same company, don't worry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've got eight bikes on the grid for Ducati. They've already got, it would seem, by the end of 2021, an advantage yeah. over everybody else. Now we've got this slight, and I mean, Dorna, Erta, FIM, particularly Erta and Dorna, have, have done s- such great things to bring yeah. it to such a competitive level where the entire field is covered by a second in qualifying. I mean, I've never seen yeah. it as good as it is, to be honest. And all of a sudden next year, it worries me, and I'm sure it does you from a technical department as well, that, that Ducati might just steal a bit of a march on 2022. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And in the ideal world, Dawn and Erta's picture was always going to be 24 bikes, six manufacturers, four bikes of each, a factory and a satellite, okay? We've got that situation obviously with Yamaha, we've got it with KTM, we've got it with Honda. Uh, For whatever reasons, obviously, Aprilia and Suzuki are not in that position to supply a team each. So somebody has to take up that slack, shall we call it, a little bit. Uh, if it, I, I don't know the reason why Suzuki have not been able to bring another or supply another team and the same with Prilia. If it's supply issues or the, they can't find a team that the contract was happy with or whatever, I don't know. But Ducati's philosophy is that they obviously, as you said, Keith, is that they, okay, we're happy to supply another team. Uh, we're, we're getting that feedback. And I'm sure there's obviously money involved. Let's be let's be brutally honest here. Obviously, I'm sure the teams are paying for that. So that budget will help develop the bike as well. So it's not the ideal situation, but we've got no choice in some respect. We need those teams to be supplied. Ducati or the manufacturers are, are stepping up to the plate and are willing to supply the team. So it's not a bad thing. Uh, I would hope and agree with all of you guys is that it'd be nice to have four and four of each manufacturer. But until Aprilia... I ha- can do this, or and a Suzuki, we, we're going to have to say help, uh, say rely on Ducati to help us out a little bit. But is it making it imbalanced? You could be right, but but then are they spreading themselves quite thinly and what development wise? Because there's always different specs of that Ducati. If you take last year, only a few of them, three of the bikes, had the full factory spec, which was Zarco and the two uh, factory bikes. The rest were lesser specs. Pete, I know you've got lined up. I, I can talk for a bloody month, as you know. So <laughs> I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Fair. No, I just, um, Danny, one of the big successes that your technical guys have had in recent years is spotting the Yamaha valve difference. Now, you know, you mentioned the, the whistleblowers, things like that. I mean, without going into specifics, I mean, are these kind of checks where, you know, you actually send parts off to be analyzed? Is, is that now standard procedure? 
you know, will that happen with the 22 engines? Is that, is that the level of checking that you put all of these parts to now? With Yamaha, I mean, not to go too much detail, Yamaha, just respect them. It, it, it was never caught with Yamaha. Yamaha came forward uh, and they were literally a, uh, above the left, well, not, not the right word, but they said, okay, this is what we've done. This is what we believe is right. And that's where the incident happened. So it was never a case of Yamaha was saying, oh, you're in trouble, we've caught you doing it. It was Yamaha coming forward. So it's slightly different. But from that situation, we have now put what's called in place is a standard checking plan. Uh, which we've started to implement this year, or it's actually set in last year now, but in 2021, is that we are now sending engines to be checked, uh, fairings to be 3D checked, wire harnesses, everything like that. So, uh, And that happened this year. Uh, we stripped one in spec of every single manufacturer that year, sent off to university to check the material, the harness, the dimensions, everything this year. And the manufacturers have been really positive of this. They've been very really helpful. Uh, it's very expensive for them because these parts are being destroyed. Uh, and I don't actually know, and you guys might, Keith might know a bit more than me, but in Formula One, I don't even think they do this in Formula One where they literally say, okay, we had it this year. Okay, I said, that engine, when it's end of life, that's been chosen to be checked. Now, you can withdraw that at any point, uh, and we would then say, okay, these parts would go to this university these parts we go to this university it will be dimensionally checked it will be material checked hardness checked uh and if all if all's okay then fine if not the engine will be disqualified uh oh. and presumably everything that it had to do with that engine will be um lost in that situation would it yes yes they, they, there's some parts that go back that they can sorry if when it's after it's been checked yeah yeah, yeah, some parts are destroyed. Yes, yeah. some parts they can reuse. But uh, what we do allow is that they can reintroduce an engine at a certain life for mileage for that. So they don't actually use lose the engine completely. Time frame, Danny. One of the things that, that obviously is critical for any new developments and the like. I'm a little bit surprised. I mean, you, I don't know whether you listen to the old podcast, and I wouldn't blame you if you didn't. But the point being is that. Uh, um, <laughs> I've been a bit concerned about the the amount of time that these teams have to get through all of their two years worth of tech freeze and all the new yeah. stuff that they've got coming up for 2022. I mean, they've just had a, a couple of days at the, the, the Madalinka, whatever it is, circuit, the, you know, the, the, even a new track that they've got no data on, which really, from a test yeah. point of view, is not really that helpful. I'm surprised that you kind of not allowed them to a, a little bit of leeway into the first couple of Grand Prix because it will cut off, won't it, in, in Qatar? That will be the end of, you know, they run what they brung after that. Yeah, but that's that's been like it for donkey's years in some respects. Uh, and don't forget, in the past, we we have mid-season tests. We obviously had Mizano this year where you saw the, probably the, the initial 22 bikes. Uh, so it's not like they come to, obviously they were in Jerez this, last week, uh, and that's the first time they've been testing these bikes already. So, uh, and we all testing agreements are done with talking to the manufacturers. So it's not a case of we say no, that's the law. We talk to them and we listen. As I say, we Ert and Dorner, obviously, and and we work very very well together to work out the testing plan, what everybody wants. It, it's all an agreement. So I'm sure the manufacturers come back to us and say, look, sorry, we need a bit longer we would accommodate it. So it's it's down to them as well to come forward. But I think they're happy. The concession system's worked really, really well, hasn't it? I mean, for, for most of the, yeah. the, the teams, that's worked brilliantly well. Um, yeah. Aprilia, though, I mean, looking at Aprilia, they've done, they've still got concessions. They've been working through through that during the course of the year. But this, do you feel that there's going to be a massive catch-up come 2022? Are we going to see real developments are we going to see really different motorbikes different bits and pieces arrive on the plot come come next year uh no i don't think you will because i think now the bikes are so well developed and it's just that little two or three percent that makes a difference you said at the beginning of this that motor gp now is so much better than it's been over the years and sorry keep going back to when you used to race what was the gap between the first and fifteenth in qualifying? It was probably about five, six seconds, maybe more. Uh, more. It was actually talking, more than yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. You actually so had lap riders in... back in the day. 
yeah, yeah. And now what we have is obviously we have the, the 15 in a second. So even for Aprilia that have concessions, they've just got to find that 1% or half percent to go that little next step. So you can't reinvent the wheel in some respects that, is- that the bikes now are direction because that works. That's the way to go. Uh, I don't think you see... But going back to concessions, yeah, earlier next year, which basically means they can, uh, testing wise, they can use their until they lose concessions. So they could obviously have they have ninety seven for the other manufacturers. The and the biggest to me is that that engine spec can be different every time they bring. The first engine could be one spec. The second engine up to the ninth different uh where the yeah, manufacturers go to con- uh, stop that's your spec for that rider yeah. for the whole season so difference like again talking about formula one, one they don't have that sort of which may be able to help them a little bit i don't no. know it's a lot of upgrades for them but it definitely well, helps ATM when... make it forward when teams have got a tiny new idea i mean i've seen you wandering up and down the paddock many many times you know we've bits and pieces under your arm and papers flying around everywhere. When somebody's trying to, how should we say, circumnavigate the um, book, um, trying to work their way around it. I mean, what's the process in that situation? Do you know what's being pushed as, a, as acceptable well in advance? Or do you suddenly, suddenly, does it suddenly appear in the paddock and you go, hang on a second and everyone's on your case, the journalists and other teams, they're on your, your case to sort it out. I mean, do, do they approach you for what they think is an appropriate within the rules modification? Yeah, ninety uh, percent of the manufacturers to me first and show me this is what they're proposing. Is it legal? Some will think again their opinion, and this is where sometimes there is a has a rule now. They all I always say to them, the philosophy is if it's legal, I say nothing. Then you can do it. I will tell you, but I then say, I then tend to put it out there so no one else makes the same mistake. So, okay, if we think it's within the rules, okay, well done, congratulations, but oddly I say nothing. If it's illegal, okay, sorry guys, no, we don't agree with this. It's like the guidelines we have, the aero, aero package. Anything that I deem is not correct, it goes out to every manufacturer. I don't say who thought of the idea, but it, everybody's aware of it. So they all know they're going in the same direction. But uh, mm. there are some manufacturers that think, okay, let's, we believe this is correct. But now they're sort of to understand a little bit more. It's better to talk to us, get approval, and then they've got no problems. Danny, so we're, one of the big developments, we've seen fairings, and then we've seen ride height devices. Now, it, it used to be just a very small sentence, I think, in the rules that said nothing electronic. Yeah. It's been expanded a little bit. Could you just sort of explain yeah. what teams can do and what they can't do with these ride height devices? Okay, uh, as you say, it's it's definitely got probably the next step from aero package is what the teams are going towards. But very simply, as you said, it can't be electronic. So it has to be rider input, rider control. It's simple as that. Uh, I've actually got a rule book here, but just to probably easy to read it out. Uh, passive determined by forces displacement directly transmitted by mechanical hydraulic connections. Uh, for example, according to the above, ride height systems that operate on collapsible elements that collapse extend under the load they are subject to and are locked and unlocked by the rider, which is the important point, and or by mechanical triggered locks are allowed. So if you take, for example, obviously the uh, start procedure, uh, what, what you call it now, um, Sorry. Whole shot. Whole, whole shot device. Whole shot. That's it. Sorry, brain fade. The whole shot device. Obviously, it's engaged by the rider. Obviously, you see him on a grid when he comes to engage it, puts the lever down. It's all mechanical. But as he gets to the first corner, the force of the brake releases that mechanism. And to be honest, ride heights works the same sort of way as that. But it You've cannot got a problem be there, electronic. Though, in, a, in, a, in a safety type of issue, haven't you, really, with... with... You know, the release mechanism, if it wasn't to release in some way, I, I remember hearing from the paddock that Suzuki weren't going to use it in a couple of places because theirs hadn't yet been developed to quite the same as, as yeah. some of the other teams. And as much as that, if it didn't release and you ch- chuck it into somewhere like Cavone, for instance, turn 11 yeah. at Mizano, 
you know, if it didn't release when they dropped in there and you got your ass dragging on the floor with the right eye adjuster still sitting down, that could um, be catastrophic. I mean, is there a, I can't imagine there is a mechanism for you as a technical director to be able to oversee or put a a protocol in place that guaranteed the safety of something like that? Or is there? No, no, not at all. Um, It's the same as a throttle. As you know, the old days, a throttle gets stuck open. You've got the same problem. Uh, And if the brakes fail, it's the same problem. Uh, I I think we we try to police as much as we can. And it's, again, it was one of those areas of the rule book where we didn't see this happening a little bit like fairings and the teams or the manufacturers exploited this. So we just have to control, hence why we put that new section in the suspension and dampers in the rule book uh, to control, to understand what is allowed and what isn't. But uh, you imagine again, if you knew everything, you know, now you could have built a hell of a motorbike, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be a very rich man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's <laughs> almost as rich as Keith. <laughs> i've got That's four it, children yeah. there's nothing rich about yeah. me yeah yeah okay fair enough. but uh, yeah, no, it's, yeah, no, yeah. it's one of those the, the talking point of this season for sure and how they work and what to consider as automatic and every, and, and not but the important thing is said what i tend to do and i have seen all of them is literally go into the pit box and said okay Disconnect all electronics. Show me how it works. It must be able to engage and disengage without any power going to it, any electrons. And it has to be that it's in that position where it it doesn't need to be charged either, even by air, gas, or fluid. So it's basically can can, can, t- can keep going all the time. So they don't have to recharge it when they come back after each session because that's not allowed. It has to be in its own position. I can see why that rule book is getting thicker. <laughs> yeah. You got you mentioned the rule book is a lot thinner. It's a lot thinner because the, it used to be in French as well. So technically it should be twice the size. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's got thinner. It's only because we're taking out the French. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. Um Dan, we had a few listener questions coming as well, sort of on on different a few different tangents, but sort of all, all linking together as well and looking at, at what's happening post the uh, the technical freeze and especially all the, the new winglets we've yeah. seen pop up on, on various bikes this year. Um, and Eggy has asked, what is the difference between the MotoGP wings that were banned two years ago and the ones that we have now looking especially at the Aprilia? They seem to be sort of just as, just as harmful. 